Um, yes. Um, well, let's just kick off. A little while ago, we reached uh, somewhat of a milestone, I, I, you might say. We reached, reached 100 million active users, um, or monthly active users, as we tend to call them, which is uh, apparently a very common or, or metric for what a user is. Uh, and that was, of course, way, but it was also, of course, whoa, and what now? And the woes is pretty much what I'm going to talk to about today. So it will be, unfortunately, mostly a lot of whining. Uh, and I hope you're good with that. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Please interrupt for questions if you think I'm getting too whiny. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, 100 million users. Um, that's quite a lot. I mean, it's not a lot compared to Google or Facebook, or, or, but at least it is over 1% of the world's population. I believe we're now even over 1.5% of the world's population, but it's uh, numbers that I'm totally not ready to commit to in any way. Um, but, yeah, that's quite a lot of people. And what we're in now, Spotify, uh, how many of you use Spotify, by the way? Most of you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. Um, what Don Eliek, our, our, our founder, our co-founder and, and, and CEO usually uh, likes to say, and he likes to talk about this a lot, that we're now in the boss fight. Uh, we're fighting the big ones. We're fighting Google, we're fighting Apple, we're fighting all, all those people. Um, I don't know whether those are Apple or Google that you have to figure that out for yourselves. Um, but that's where we are, and we're still a fairly small company compared to them. We're two and a half thousand employees right now. Usually, when I say that, people say, "Go, what does all those people do? Two and a half thousand—that's a lot." Well, I'll tell you in a little while what we all do, but it's it's a lot. Um, so, what does the boss fight look like? Well, we have. 100 million monthly active users. We have 37 daily active users, 37 million daily active users, which is also quite a lot. That's like three and a half Swedens. Um, 40 million subscribers. We hit that fairly recently. Um, we're in 60 countries. Uh, we use all the large CDNs. These are just numbers that I've obviously put here to impress you. Are you impressed? No, okay, I, I wouldn't say. I think more, more to the point, we have, we're now at around 13,000 servers, um, and we have an Hadoop cluster that is 2,500 nodes. Uh, and to me, as an infrastructure engineer, that's obviously a scale that makes any kind of sense. I mean, the number of uses. Uh, but, and also, 100 gigabits of network capacity to each site, not at the site, but to each site. Um, it also ends up to we're having about 20 million uh, uh, simultaneous connections from clients. And I'll get into that a little bit, what that looks like. But suffice to say that 20 million clients that are connected to your backend is a pretty awesome DDoS hammer if you know how to build it. Uh, and we do. <laughs> we do know how to DDoS ourselves. Um, we have about 2 million requests per second. Um, peak, uh, and we collect about 20 terabytes of, of, of data per day. Um, pretty big numbers for us. Uh, so the question is, of course, how do we do that? How do we manage all this? Well, as was post, uh, post uh, said to Bertrand Russell at one point, you're a very clever young man, but it's turtles all the way down. And exactly, that's exactly, of course, what we're doing. We try to make every layer scale as, as, as far as we can. Um, we're, not all, all, we're not always successful in that, but I mean, that's really what you need to do in order to, to be able to handle this, this kind of pressure. And particularly handle it with, with some sort of, of, without wasting an enormous amount of money. So just a quick look at what we look like. So this is just a principle of what our backend look like. We have every client connects, actually connects to um, 
uh, when, the, when the client starts, it opens a TCP connection and just keeps that open uh, for the entire lifetime of, of, of that of, of the client. Um, back in the days when there were only desktop clients, those would be open for days. Uh, now with mob, this mostly mobile uh, uh, devices, obviously there's uh, deactivation and reactivation patterns and so on. So we get an awful lot of, of, of uh, uh, flutter in that, but. They try to keep that. Whenever you use the client, there's a TCP connection open to our backend. Uh, to something that we call an access point, which is a behemoth of a, a software piece of software, uh, 150,000 lines of C++. It's really fast. It's incredibly fast, fast as hell. But um, it's also very, fairly complex. Uh, however, it does give us, or actually together with to other pieces of software, it gives us fairly good traffic shaping. Um, and I think the traffic shaping is, is probably that saves us the most. Uh, so because we have queues here and there. Uh, first of all, since we have a persistent connection, that means that we can tell the clients things. We can tell the clients, for instance, to log out and log into another, uh, uh, another site, uh, which is very convenient we, if we want to uh, drain an entire or evacuate an entire site, which we do on a regular basis uh, for test or just because there's a problem at that site. We can just move all the users to another site in about five minutes. Um, and that, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, it also means that the access point can tell the client to back off, for instance, and saying like that. So please back off. We're a little bit busy around here, so back off and, and come back in 17 seconds or something like that. And that w also works well. But of course, we have control over both ends, so that works well for us. But it also means that we can queue stuff on every level. So the access point request coming in from the, access, uh, from the client, so the access point is then, then just uh, sent as pretty much messages or requests um, to backend services, and we have I think about 300 of them or something like that. It's very hard to count. Um, but they do different things, like there's a playlist backend service for storing all your playlists. There is an artist backing backend service that aggregates everything about an artist in the artist view and just shows that. So that, in turn, calls a lot of other backend services and a Cassandra cluster and, and metadata index and, and so on. Um, and we do this using our own protocol, uh, called Hermes. We used to use uh, HTTP, but it had too much jitter, uh, so we replaced it with something of our own. And particularly, whenever we, do, we detect that we, we're not going to be able to make, uh, or we, we have a little bit too much load, we can fast fail the request and just say, well, you know what? This, this, won't, th this won't work. It's a little bit like, well, we need to have the talk or something like that. This won't work. So we're just uh, returning that, uh, that call. Just take from the back of the queue and go, fail of them. Yeah? There's a question from the audience. Can I have my mic turned on, please? Oh. So, <laughs> so, uh, well, that's a good question. Let's read the question, question out, uh, out loud so we can hear it. Uh, so how long do you keep your 20 terabyte day log data? Oh. Uh, well, some of it we keep indefinitely, uh, but we have a fairly aggressive data retention policy, uh, among other reasons because uh, all the so all the that data is transferred into our Hadoop cluster, which turns out to be a surprisingly hard problem to solve, uh, transferring 20 terabytes of data per day into the Hadoop cluster. Uh, but we do all of it goes into the Hadoop cluster. Then we do uh, some processing and split it up into business-critical data, which is, for instance, what did people play? Uh, because we need to pay people for what, <laughs> for what our users played. So therefore, that is, that is uh, stored indefinitely. That's also a very great treasure for us, because we know, for, for the last 10 years, we know how a, bu a bunch of million of people what they listen to down to the second. So that's a treasure that no one else has. Uh, most of it we throw away after a fairly short while, like a month or so.
Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool. Um, um, so, looking at this, sort of this stack then, uh, what it boils down to is, one, as I said, one TCP connection per client. Uh, we have roughly one request per 40 seconds for every client in general. Um, most of it is service interaction, that is search or, or, or sort of artist view or something like that. And some of it is, as I said, end song, which is what do people play? And an end song is emitted whenever, um, whenever a song ends or we, so the user skips a song uh, or press, press stop or, or whatever. Uh, right. So, looking at some of the details, details about this, uh, the Hermes protocol, uh, built on ZeroMQ, uh, actually it isn't built on ZeroMQ any longer, it is built on the ZeroMQ wire protocol, because uh, the ZeroMQ had bad semantics around when a connection was dropped. <laughs> We couldn't actually, it couldn't actually tell us that, so we, we had to implement our own. It's awesome, it's really awesome. It's fast, uh, um, and it gives us those traffic shaping, uh, uh, traffic, that traffic shaping semantics uh, around that. It rocks, really. Uh, other than that, it kind of looks, for the, for, our, uh, for the developers, it kind of looks like uh, HTTP because of historical reasons and also because it works, and we use protobuf. And by introducing Hermes, we managed to reduce the number of the, the jitter that we had in just the protocol, on just the protocol level from HTTP uh, to Hermes, we managed to reduce it by something around 30%, which is a lot. And as I will be pointing out, jitter matters. So the next thing, uh, this is not, not some, something we are doing, but this is illustrating a kind of a point, Cassandra, uh, I guess most of you have heard, heard, heard of Cassandra, one of the NoSQL databases with eventual consistency and no acid con uh, contracts and so on. We use that primarily for our storage, particularly because the local node access, so whenever, we, whenever a client wants to write or read, it goes to the node that, hash that has that part of the hash, uh, 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 distributed hash table. Um, the problem with that is, databases are expensive. Uh, not because the software is expensive, but, but because it still doesn't perform that well. Cassandra is really, really fast. It's faster for writing than reading. Uh, we have our own compaction uh, strategies that we developed uh, in order to make it even faster, but we still need to run it on uh, really, really, really expensive uh, storage hardware. These are Fusion I.O. cards, I think they cost around 130,000 kronos a piece for three terabytes. Uh, that's what we run all our, data, uh, all our databases on. It's the only way we can f make them perform. We tried everything else. There's, we just need really, really fast uh, disk access. Which <laughs> is unfortunate, because I promised war story in my blurb. It's, an, it's the first war story. Um, we have another... We have a, so the 20 terabytes per day, that's logs, that's client interaction, that's end song, and all that kind of data. We also collect almost as much data from all our servers, just telemetrics, just CPU load and all that stuff. And we do that using a uh, system that we call Alien and Heroic. Uh, and it's stored in a Cassandra cluster, and they were looking at, so we need to build out the Cassandra cluster in order to survive the next six months, I think, and they realized that the cost of buying that many Fusion I.O. nodes would be roughly equivalent to buying two Teslas for each employee at Spotify. So they decided not to do that. I, I was trying to convince them, so like, let's just buy, buy one Tesla each, and then we saved half of the money. Come on. But no, they didn't fall for that. Um, so, um, 
databases and that kind of, of access is still very expensive for us, uh, unfortunately. Um, and we don't know how to solve that yet. Oh, what happened, of course, was that uh, what happened is that they we, we now do that with Google because we could get storage from Google uh, on petabyte scale for a lot less. So all our ma uh, monitoring data is now stored uh, in, in big, Google Big Data. Uh, all right. So next thing, all, co all code is asynchronous. This is supposed to illustrate jazz. If you didn't get that, I don't know. As synchronous as uh, and, and uh, never mind. Um, <laughs> so the reason we want to do this is because of of resource management. Whenever a resource is hogged, it will in turn stop up other threads. So if we were to do this uh, thread based for instance, we could be stopping up for, I mean, for, for one scarce resource in, um, in a machine is, for instance, threads. Threads are expensive. P-threads are way too expensive for us. A couple of megs per P-thread doesn't work. Um, so we try to do everything in our code so that we do something and then just yield, do something then just yield, so therefore everything all our backend is based on futures. So whenever, when we call another service, we get a future. When we try to read from database, we get a future. When we write to the database, we get a future. And then we have our own service framework, written by Matthias over there, by the way, <laughs> that uh, resolves all this graph for us. Fortunately, of course, the code can be a little bit complex. This is a part, part of the system uh, called uh, sellout. It's our upsell system, therefore we call it sellout. Um, and what we're trying to do here is just assess whether a user is eligible for one of our offers, like three months for one for uh, one dollar or or something else. And you can see the first thing we need to do is get from the username we need to get a user ID. So we have a get user ID which returns a future. And then we use that future here, there, in consume eligibility, and we change that future. So, so that's kind of what, the, what the, the code looks like. And this is all for man manage, really for managing Jitter. Because whenever there is something, there's something with the network, there's something like that, we tend to fill up queues, and if we tend to fill up queues, if we fill up queues, then suddenly, uh, requests start to fail because of the fast fail I talked about, and now we have a service disruption. So let me talk a little bit about Jitter. Um, because of the network, my, the, the vast majority of user, our users are, are um, mobile users now. So because of mobile networks, we have, we think, about 200 milliseconds budget for a request. Uh, and that is including everything in our backend, like the time it spends in the queue, uh, transfer over data center networks, uh, cross-site network tra uh, 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 traffic, database access, disk access, message routing, encryption, and so, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down. More turtles. Um, so everything that we do, we need to sort of respond to this. And as, as, as you saw, it's quite, quite a complex uh, story. And nowadays, with the current scale, there is very few. It doesn't have to be that much jitter for us to get the service disruption. And I'll tell you a story. Um, so this was three years ago, a little bit over three years ago. I just joined. Uh, and I was the um, acting. Uh, director for uh, back in infrastructure at the time because my manager was out of town and he left the tribe, as we call them, over to me. Kind of a mistake, but he didn't know that at the time. I started out as a manager, but then I saw the error in my way, so now I'm an engineer. Um, and suddenly, while I was on my way in to work, the music stopped. And we don't like that to stop. And it turned out 
what happened. So that day was probably the worst day in my life. Um, <laughs> that was a very stressful day. Um, so what happened was that they were doing uh, power maintenance on our Stockholm site. And uh, all the servers have obviously two, pow uh, two power feeds, a, a power and B power. And we switched over to B power because they were man maintaining the, uh, a or repairing the A power. So everything worked fine, except the Lighthouse management switches, that is the administration console switches uh, for all the servers. So they were going up and down, but that, that was fine. We, didn't, we don't use that that much, so that's okay. Uh, we, we could live without that for a while. And it would have been fine if it weren't for the fact that someone had left a TP uh, cable between the Lighthouse management switch, or one of the Lighthouse management switches, and one of the production switches. Uh, which also would have been fine if it weren't for that, but that particular brand of switch had a bug in which when it when, when, when the power was flipped like that, suddenly it erased all its routing tables, and now we had a routing loop, because it started routing traffic on that interface. So, Stockholm network went down, because all we had was a, just a network loop, so we had all the tra production traffic just clogging that loop, so Stockholm went down. That would also have been fine, we can, we can normally survive a, uh, a, a data center outage, the client will de detect that this is happening or will just move them and they will reconnect to another data center and so on. We can normally survive that. However, <laughs> and actually it did come up, as it says here, site, still site went down, seemed network related, came, up an, uh, came back up an hour later. However, in the meantime, <laughs> something else had happened. So, what had happened was that the Cassandra clients, they were misconfigured because they, I mean, they go to the right node for reading and writing for that particular part of the key space. And in this particular case, they didn't distinguish between remote site and local site. So, some of the clients or some of the writes and reads to the social cluster, you know, that annoying little bar of, of, of sort of what your friends are listening at thing. Yes. Um, that was misconfigured. So, some of the requests take, took an awful lot of time to time out. And we have pretty aggressive timeouts. Um, uh, in our back end, uh, two, three seconds at most, because we want to fail fast. That didn't help. So what happened was that all those uh, social requests were, were uh, taking too much time uh, to finish, which started uh, uh, filling up queues. And that would have been fine, because the only thing that we would have normally done was to uh, uh, fast fail uh, fast fail the request, or, or sort of there would have been some, some disruption. However, it turned out that the queues were also misconfigured. So the queue depth, the total queue depth between the router and the broker was 100,000 requests. Now it starts to take time. <laughs> now it took several minutes to get through that, that queue because it was clogged up by social, uh, social backend requests. Uh, we fixed that as well. Uh, we learned a lot from this incident. So now London went down. Uh, Ashburn and San Jose, which is our two other sites, or physical sites, we also uh, have a, a couple of Google sites now uh, using GCP. Uh, Ashburn and, and San Jose survived because they didn't have that much traffic because this was early in the morning in Europe, which means in the middle of the night in, in US. Or it was actually not early in the morning, it was like 9, 10. So a little bit of jitter. Two, three seconds for a request turned out to have these disastrous uh, consequences for us. Uh, and we don't have 100,000 requests queue depth any longer, but we still have that, uh, that jitter problem. That it, it hits us every time. So right, so we're at 100 million. Our next architectural goal is 1 billion. Should be okay, right? Yeah. So, just scaling. 10 times, what do we get? 400 million subscribers, 
370 million daily active users, 130,000 servers, 25k node Hadoop cluster, one terabyte transit per s no, no. That, that, that isn't what it's going to look like, because we do scale horizontally, but we don't scale linearly. So these numbers are all off. It's going to be a lot more. Um, so uh, using the CDNs that we use pro probably won't work that well for us. Um, when Facebook hit like a billion or something to that effect, they started building the Umeo site, which was just that site, 200,000 servers. Um, so we're not going to get away with 130,000 servers, I'm pretty certain. Um, 25,000 uh, node Hadoop cluster would be the largest in the world. No one has ever built that, far, uh, that, lo that large, as far, far as I know. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, one terabyte of, of network uh, capacity to each site. Nope, not even Google has that. Uh, as it turns out, they do an awful lot of peering. They do have that capacity in total, but they do an awful lot of peering, so they don't have that. And 200 terabytes of data per day. No, not even Facebook does that. <laughs> uh, they filter uh, uh, very, very aggressively in order to keep up with all the data they collect, uh, sort of the statistics they collect around the user's behavior. So, what we are, what we're at is that I don't know what we're going to look like if we be able, be able to scale to one billion users, but I know that it's not going to look like this. And herein lies our problem. Because we've managed to, we've discovered a while ago, just as Google, Facebook, and, and the others that sort of in that scale area, is that for every order of magnitude, we pretty much need to re-architect everything that we do. And what the next uh, sort of problem, so the next big problem for the next order of magnitude is, we don't know yet. And it's always something that we absolutely didn't expect, like databases in this particular case, or Yitter, we didn't expect that either, because we thought we built it for a fairly robust, it's a fairly robust stack. But it turned out to be a big problem, um, and so on. And we don't know what these, these are. And furthermore, we are kind of in a low margin business. I mean, all, all, we give away 70% uh, of our re total revenue. Not, we don't have anything else. We have that. What people pay for, the, uh, uh, for, for using the service or sort of add uh, add uh, revenue, we give 70% of that away. And it's also to uh, come to our attention that looking at retention numbers on family plan and um, student discount and so on, turns out that the general public thinks that $10 per month for uh, mus all sort of universal music access is too large. Because the moment we lower that to like, in average, people pay five dollars per, per user if they uh, are on a family plan, for instance. Then the retention is jumps up with a lot um, to almost full retention uh, after the first three months. So we need to find a way of doing this scaling to the next level better and cheaper particularly, than the rest of them. Um, and, I mean, we could throw hardware uh, uh, and money at the problem, but we, as sort of the story about the heroic cluster, turns out we're now at the scale where that doesn't really work any longer. So, what are we supposed to do? Well, one thing that we do know is that uh, we need better concurrency. Because Jitter turns out to be a problem, we're still going to need to have that. We need to do, um, well, I'll go back to that. We need better parallelism because we also have stuff that we just can't do today. Uh, and also we need better isolation because we have too much cross effects between different, different things, network and so on. So looking at better concurrency, looking back at this sellout system, 
This is very nice, and, and it works really, really well, and it's fast. However, what we really like to do is write something like this, right? This is the gist of, of that code. Um, and the, this code takes quite a lot of effort to write. This is what we would like. However, we can't get that. So this is something that we would like to have better. Easier, simpler. I love Erlang, Joe. I love Erlang. Erlang doesn't seem to love me back, though, because I ever write, whenever I write something in Erlang, it always tends, turns out a mess. So <laughs> I don't know. We probably, uh, Joe has promised to, to help us go to Erlang, so we'll see. Um, better concurrency. And also because, consider this. I work in the payment. Uh, my recent work was actually family plan. Um, this is probably the most complex uh, area we have. We have 20 different payment methods in 60 different countries. We have five different subscription states. We have seven different payment states. Whenever you do a payment, it can go through seven different states. And we have nine different product states. And we only have one product. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, yeah, we have a lot of stuff, I mean, a family plan and all that stuff. And all this in 350,000 uh, lines of Python. Yes, it's terrible. I'll tell you, I'm right, tell you right now here. A uh, lot of this is my, my fault as well. So doing this with that kind of structure that we had there, that's just something that we've been pondering for the last year now uh, in, in, in pay payment or iron bank, as we call that department, is how are we going to do this? Well, this won't work, because that logic, we, we will actually never be able to. I mean, some of our programmers, actually a lot of our programmers are really smart, but not that smart. Uh, so we need to figure out something else. Um, so in that respect, we're still sort of, even though we're in the biggest yarn, ball of yarn there is, we're still unhappy uh, or sad. Better parallelism. Well, we have 200 milliseconds for the requests. But what about those things that we just don't, can't perform on one core or on one thread on 200 milliseconds? Well, search. Usually when we do the search, the basic search, searching for an artist or a song or something like that, um, we have a song catalog, it's 30 million songs, uh, mutation rate of that is 20,000 per week, so it's fairly static. Um, so we have a metadata um, index that is, lives entirely in memory, uh, it is distributed, it is our own file format called Sparky, and it's distributed using BitTorrent through all the metadata uh, servers. It's actually pretty cool and works really, really well, and it's fast. So that, I mean, that works well, because we can keep that index in memory, because it's only 30 million songs. Playlist search, however. Uh, we're at 2 billion playlists now. I think we're a lot more than, I think that number is pretty old and off. So we have uh, way over 2 billion uh, playlists. Right now we use Elasticsearch, which is not bad, but it's definitely not where we wa would want to be. Uh, uh, because it does support some fuzzy, fuzzy matching, but what if we want to do a complete k-nearest neighbor or, or something like that? That just won't work. And there's no way we can do this uh, with the kind of computer resources we have. So all kind of systems we have. So look at this. How many of you use Discover Weekly? Oh, some of you. Do you like it? Cool. Thank you. It's awesome. Um, so Discover Weekly, for those of you who don't use it, uh, takes your listening habits. Look at what you've saved in, in, your, uh, in your collection and what you have in your playlists and what artists you follow and what you've listened to the last week. And then creates a playlist with songs that you may or may not like. That's the entire idea. It's for you to discover new, new music. And this is something that is very important for us, because what we do, I mean, we're we making money for the artist, which means that we need to bring users to the artist, which means that we need to bring people that like that kind of music to the artist that play that kind of music. So this is 
core for us, really. So why is it a playlist? Well, because the playlists we can create are uh, offline in our, our, our Hadoop cluster. So that's what we do. Every week we, we run a big job on this gigantic Hadoop cluster and generate playlists for 100 million users um, based on this. And that's the only way we can do it. We can't generate this on, fly, on the fly because we just don't have the time. Right, so better installation. Um, okay. Okay. Yes? There is uh, one oh. more uh, question. So given that you want to be more efficient, is there any way to estimate the minimal amount of hardware you need given perfect software? Oh, good question. Um, no. <laughs> Um, uh, less. Um, I would like us to be, if we could do this, if we could scale up to the same scale as, as Google and Facebook and those guys, and do it with the tenth of the cost in, in infrastructure, that would be really, really cool. That would be really, really, really cool. I don't know if we can, but I'm going to figure find out. So isolation is another thing, um, because as you saw with uh, the uh, um, power maintenance uh, incident, uh, at this scale we often have cascading errors or cascading, uh, uh, or cascading faults. So they just sort of cascade all over, the way, all over the place. And we do our best to isolate. For instance, we don't do multi-tenancy on our own hardware. We run one service per server, a uh, couple of servers per service, never multi-tenancy, because we don't want one thing to, to impact, impact the other. If some service goes haywire, because we write fast, we, <laughs> we run fast and we break things, so sometimes we just fuck up, and that's what we do. Uh, we don't want that to impact other things. But there's still network and still other things, and the more isolation that we can get on this and still running on a decent amount of hardware is great. So, with that, questions? Yes, Joe. You said you have permanent TCP connections. Client, yep. How many, sorry, you said you've got permanent TCP connections per user. How many connections do you maintain on one machine? In about, what is it, 200,000 something? We yeah, should have a talk. Something like that. Okay. We can do 6 million on one machine. All right. That's why all the games people are using it, for, for the connection yeah. servers. It's relatively I know we easy. should talk. <laughs> More questions? Uh, yes. So I was a little, a little bit surprised uh, on the fact that you generate these uh, suggestions uh, weekly, like offline. It seems to me like it's really like brute force, like sol trying to solve a problem. Like uh, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel right. <laughs> so so my point is my point is don't don't you use some kind of uh, historical you know way of of calculating this? I mean, do you do you really start from scratch every single no. week? No. We don't. Uh, that's a little bit of an oversimplification. Uh, okay, okay. It's just an egg on that feeling. So. They, they do, uh, we do have, every user do have a taste profile that is generated and refined over time. Okay. Uh, and, and that is actually stored in a service. And we have had some success in, in actually matching because we do have online recommendations, but uh, in my opinion, they're not as good, like radio or, or stuff like that. Um, but uh, the, and we've had some success in, in sort of filtering recommendations or filtering sort of a playlist uh, through those uh, uh, taste profiles. But it's still pretty expensive, and we would like to do more. And that's a problem because we need to uh, innovate in order to, to, to survive in this business because we don't have the vast amount of resources that Google and, and, and Apple does. So we need to innovate, which needs, means that we need to do, be able to do more than they can think of, or we need to think of more. And we can't think of the things that we can't do, pretty much.
So you recently uh, moved some of the services to Google infrastructure. What services did you move? Uh, we're moving everything. Everything? Yeah. We, uh, so um, how that will affect many of the issues that you talked about? Um, oh. Initially, not I that mean, much. you're not going to, do, to use a Hadoop file system? We no? are still using Hadoop. Uh, I actually don't know. Uh, I, our analytics people have uh, moved over to uh, using uh, Google Analytics. Yeah, Google no, Data Flow. Google Data Flow. BigQuery. Yeah, yeah, BigQuery. Uh, a lot. Yeah. Um, whether uh, we will completely abandon uh, Hadoop for that, I don't know yet. I, I would say that no one does because we haven't made yeah, up our mind on that. I mean, it takes time anyway. For yeah, it does. To move. Uh, so, but but there, I mean, you're worried about scaling your infrastructure. So mm -hmm. maybe some of this problem will be problem of Google? <laughs> yes, as it turns out, I mean, I have great respect for Google. Those guys know a lot of stuff. But as it turns out, not even they uh, can defy the laws of physics. Um, and there's some stuff that they don't do well either, uh, unfortunately. And, just that, and, and Of course, that's always the stuff that we need. So. <laughs> Right, so maybe we should take one of the questions oh, yeah. up from, uh, from the screen. So maybe we can take uh, Netflix and Spotify both deliver media. How do they two differ? Ah, good question. Um, quite a lot, as a matter of fact. Um, Netflix has an awful lot of more uh, uh, content. I mean, larger content. It's video, and it's high-resolution video, and it's even 4K video nowadays. So that's their big problem in it's just streaming that video, delivering that video to the client. However, their interaction level with the back end is fairly low because, I mean, you, if you look at the TV series episode, you pause like once or twice. Uh, we have an end song every three minutes at the very least. Uh, we have like back end requests every 40 seconds from our clients. Uh, Netflix totally doesn't have that. So we have an awful lot of more backend traffic, but we have a lot less content traffic. So I mean, for us, 30 million songs, that's just a bunch, couple of terabytes, 20 terabytes, 40, 50 terabytes, or something like that. That's actually fairly easy to deliver. Um, because also, we, are, we deploy caches and, and use CDNs, all the CDNs on the planet, just to deliver it very easily. Um, to uh, to the clients, so quite a lot, as a matter of fact. There's not much that we can that is comparable between the two of us. Yes, right. We can take one more question, I think, from from uh, from the screen, and then we'll be deferring the rest to to offline. Right. So, uh, does work like generate playlists map well to the MapReduce programming model, or are you using it despite an inefficient algorithm? <sighs> I think for generating playlists, it actually works, maps not spectacularly well, but it's definitely not the worst fit we've seen. A really bad fit is those taste profiles, for instance, because that's a lot more, uh, a lot more data involved in, 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 uh, uh, in doing that, uh, which means that, I mean, that, that moves in kind of to the territory of, of, of uh, algorithm training. And algorithm training is, is terrible on, on Hadoop. Um, so just running through that actually works fairly well, I would say. All right. All right. So Turbin, you will stick around, and people yes. can grab you and ask you questions about Spotify. Please do. Uh, later, right. But now we're moving on in the program to our next speech. So let's thank Turbin. Thank you.